of you before in my classes and maybe down the line when you're taking other classes, maybe I'll see you again. Um, yeah, hopefully I'll see you again. Uh, I teach philosophy here at Green River as well as the, some humanities classes. Um, the philosophy classes I teach are usually based on religion, gender, ethics, um, specifically like environmental ethics. So really interesting stuff here. Um, today I'm going to give you a little bit of a taste of something that I would teach in my comparative religion class. I also cover it in my uh, women in world religions class. Um, so it's very important, and I'm sure most of you have probably heard of that topic already. Have many of you heard of Confucianism before? Confucianism? Have you heard of Confucius? Uh, or Kongza? No? I just hear of Confuce. Yeah. Confuce? <laughs> really? Interesting. Okay. So um, this is a figure who is very important in Chinese philosophy and whose students... Right, his disciples actually had a lot of impact on Chinese legalism and then communism later on. So he has a very big impact, not just in China, but all over the world. And so we're just going to get to know him a little bit today and some of his philosophy. Have you heard that word before, philosophy? What does that mean? If you have a philosophy about something. Any ideas? About, your, about human thing. About human brain or knowledge? Knowledge has a lot to do with it, and so it's a lot about the kinds of questions we ask. So you're right, right? About our brain, we are asking questions, right? You guys have brains? Yes? You're not robots? Right? So when you have a brain and it's functioning properly, you're asking questions about the world, whether they're in a psychology class, in a science class, in an art class. Whether you're watching a really fun movie, right, or reading a comic book, you have questions about things that are going on in the world, and philosophy has a very rich history of asking those questions and really arguing about the answers, right? That's what philosophers do. We just argue with each other forever and ever and ever. But um, through all that arguing, we get to some really interesting possibilities. And one of the things that all Eastern philosophy is focused on, including Confucianism, are a couple questions. First, about human nature. Right? So what is it about us as humans that makes us special, right? different from plants or animals? And also, how we become better human beings. Right? So we might have a certain nature to begin with, but we live in different societies. Those societies affect us. Uh, we have different families and friends and jobs and things that we like. So how can we talk about all those things in a way that makes us better human beings? Right? So we do good things, not bad things. And we treat each other well. And so human nature, and then what they call self-cultivation. Right? Are some of the things that Chinese philosophy really focuses on. And Confucius, or Kongza, who we're going to talk about today, says a lot about why we should cultivate ourselves and how we go about doing that in the best way. Right. So I'm going to give you a little heads up. There's going to be a lot of words up on the board like a lot. Don't try to write all of them down. <laughs> if you can find like one keyword here or there or a couple keywords to focus on, that's going to really help you take notes. Um, so like names, dates, a word you've never seen before, you want to look that up later, right? Those sorts of things. Don't try to write them all down because um, I'm going to kind of be going through them at a brisk pace. So here we go. When we're looking at the history of China. Obviously, we have many dynasties that were in power, but one of the most significant periods, especially when philosophy was the most rich, is a time called the Warring States period. This is also called the Classical period. In philosophy, it's better known as the 100 Schools period. And this is because at the time before that, the Zhou dynasty, there was a great ruler. But he was trying to impress this girl. Right? We all know where this is going. <laughs> and so to impress this girl, he would take her out and he would light the fires that would call all of the neighboring warriors to come and protect him. Right? This was like a warning flame that says, your emperor is in trouble, you need to come protect him. So have you heard the story of the boy who cried wolf? Yes. Right? Yeah. 
you lie so many times and then people stop believing you, right? So he lit the fire so many times to impress this girl that when he was actually under attack, nobody came <laughs> to protect him. So this enter entered us from what was known as the golden age, right, when everything was very peaceful, to a time of conflict, right, where all of these different states in China were fighting each other, right, there was brutality on the streets, parents killing children, children killing parents, ch killing grandparents, strangers killing each other. Anyone know the show The Walking Dead? The zombies? It's like post-apocalyptic world, right? Anything goes, okay? So, since this period was full of chaos and war and suffering, a lot of schools, philo philosophical schools, decided they were going to try and figure out how to regain peace. And there were many different ideas. So this was the most fruitful time in philosophy in China, where we have lots of different people trying to come up with solutions. So there were a like hundred schools, or there were probably even more than that. Right? So, there are four big ones that we learn about today, right? Because this was a long time ago. The one that we're going to talk about today is Confucianism, but some which you may have also heard of, but maybe not, are Moism, Taoism, and Legalism. Right? So these are the four big schools that we still learn about today. And they each took a very different approach on how to create peace in a time of great suffering. Confucianism focused on modeling your behavior after a really good example, right? So your job in life is to find not just a teacher, right? But someone who you can live a life exactly like they do, right? They're providing an example or they're modeling behavior for you to follow. And when you find that model, they will also teach you how to become a good person through rituals. Right? So engaging in certain behaviors, actions, ceremonies that follow very specific guidelines. Really specific. Like you have to use a pot that's made out of the right kind of clay or it doesn't work. And by showing respect for rituals and ceremony, this will help us cultivate virtue. And by studying with a teacher and modeling our behavior over time, we'll become better people. And he thought, this is how society gets better. This is how we stop hurting each other and stop fighting and enter a peaceful time. Moism wasn't crazy about the ritual stuff. Neither was Taoism. They're like, we don't like that. We don't like people telling us what to do. Right? Is that anybody here? We don't like listening to rules. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Moists thought that instead of having this hierarchy, or people telling you what to do, a whole chain of command, instead of that, we should just have universal values that everyone learns, and we should just all love and care about each other, as if we were all brothers and sisters. So don't care about your father more than you care about a stranger on the street. Right? We should care about everyone equally, and that's how we become better people. Taoism thought that instead of trying to make yourself a better person, they thought, we're already pretty awesome people, but society has done a really bad job of covering that up with a lot of other stuff. Like having the latest phone, right, or the latest car, or the coolest new shoes, or it's really important that I go get this Starbucks right now, and not so much that I feed someone who's starving. So they thought, look, society did that to you. You weren't born that way. You weren't born caring about material things or money. So our job is not to make you better. It's to get back to a point where your natural goodness is taking, taking charge. You already are a virtuous person. So we just need to get back to that. And legalism went kind of the way of Confucianism, but really more extreme. It's not enough to just say that you should follow the rules, right, and lead, do what your teacher tells you. We need to actually have punishments in place for people who break those rules. 
because we don't trust your human nature. It's actually not so good. <laughs> it's actually pretty bad. <laughs> so we can never leave you to your own devices, right? We always need to have some sort of punishment or reward in place to make you do the right thing. So those are the four main views. But today we're going to talk about Confucianism. Any questions so far? Yes. So uh, about Taoism. Taoism. Is it like nature power? Yes, so there is. there are powers or forces in nature. So both Confucianism and Taoism talk about something called the yin yang. Have you heard of that? Yeah. So there are two forces in nature, right? One that's active, masculine, light, and one that's passive, feminine, and dark, right? Confucianism focused on the masculine power. Right? We need to be active to make you better. Taoism focused on the passive part. Right? We just need to kind of go with the flow. Right? And that's your true nature, and that will make you a good person. Okay, so let's learn about the founder of Confucianism, who again is often known as Confucius, but his real name was Master Kong or Kongzi. Am I saying that wrong? Is that why you're laughing? My pronunciation is terrible. <laughs> right? So I learned in school that it's actually much more respectful to call him Kongzi rather than Confucius because this designates him as a master and anything else does not and that's not very respectful. So Kongza is an interesting individual because he didn't come from a very wealthy background. His parents weren't rich. But because of his job, he was able to access a lot of the things that a wealthy person would access. Art, literature, music, as well as training, right, in archery and ceremonies. So he was very familiar with the life of a noble person. And he thought that since these people are rich and in power, it's their job to set an example for everyone else, right? For the people who don't get to go to school, the people who don't get taught how to read. The only way they're going to be better people is if they look to those in power and see a good example being set for them. So he really focused on teaching leaders. That was his goal. He saw that the way leaders were currently behaving was unjust, or it wasn't fair, right? They had all the money, yet they didn't seem to work very hard. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Or is this out of date? Now the people who are richest, in our, they work really hard, right? The people who are rich? Yeah, Donald Trump works really hard. <laughs> Right? He, we could probably make an argument that this is still very true today. Right? Some of the wealthiest people, what do they do? They trade stocks on the stock market. Right? They're not breaking their backs. Right? Scrubbing floors. They're not really working the hardest. So this is still very relevant today. We still have people in power who are the most rich but who aren't putting in the most work, right? He thought this was unfair. They're living these luxurious, leisurely lifestyles. Kongza was married and had two children. And after his mother died, he decided to become a teacher. He was going to start teaching these young men, who are going to be rich and powerful someday, how to be good leaders. Right? He really wanted to work in government and be an official advisor. Unfortunately, when he did get his first job, which was when he was much older, the age of 50 or 55, he didn't really like it. 
right? He said, finally, I'm going to work with this leader. This leader is going to listen to me, this duke. But the duke didn't really listen to him. He just kind of did whatever he wanted. So Kongza said, okay, instead of focusing all my energy on this one person, I'm going to travel around and meet with lots of different leaders and have conversations with them. So most of his writings, and he actually didn't write them, they were written by his students, are from him traveling around and talking to different people and having these philosophical arguments about what would a virtuous person do. He called these virtuous people gentlemen. Sorry, ladies. <laughs> ladies can be virtuous too, but at this time, only men were in positions of power. So he was dealing with men, but women have these capacities as well. Right? So he left his job in government to become a traveling scholar. When he went around talking to different people, he discussed what the ideal person should be, right? He said, okay, you're going to be a leader. Lots of people are going to look up to you. So you should do this. You should aspire to power, but not for selfish reasons. Don't be powerful for you. Be powerful so you can help other people live better lives. So do you think that's what politicians do today? They go into politics to make things better for everybody else? I see some skepticism. Maybe they start that way, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. But we're talking about systems which are already full of people who are very greedy and selfish, right? So it's very hard to be this kind of person. So Kongza said it takes practice. We have to really practice at this. It's not easy. And what he wanted to do was not just make life better. He actually wanted to revive the kind of peace they had in the Zhou dynasty, right before the Warring States period. He thought that was the best time for people to live. So we should try to get back to that. So the golden age for him is when he thought people were most at peace. The writings that we have have been compiled and are called the Analects. Have you heard of that before, the Analects? Some people? All right. Well, in these stories, they're really short passages. It says, the master says this, right? And it's some little bit of advice. And these are recollections written by his students of what he said. Right? So his students, just like you, are writing down what your teacher says? <laughs> are you going to hold on to that for like 50 years? No? Darn. <sighs> Oftentimes, what they were writing down was not just conversations between them and their teacher, but also writing down Kongs's conversations with other leaders, right? So they would take notes to make sure they recorded all of his advice. Also, because they were traveling around, they would often just stumble upon people in the street. Right? And so sometimes Kongza would have very meaningful conversations with them too, and they would write those down as well. So there's a very famous passage which says that the master says that he can learn just as much from someone who's really smart as he can from someone who's a fool. Does that sound right? You can learn just as much from both. You can learn what to be and what not to be. <laughs> this is just how the Analects are structured. Since you're not in my class, we're not going to be reading them directly. But in case you're curious, they're broken up into books and then section or Analect numbers. And the passages are kind of all over the place. But generally, they talk about why we should perform rituals a certain way, why it's so important. And also, they ask about ethics. Have you ever heard that word before? Ethics? Or morality? Yeah? 
Do you think you know what it means? No. No? Anyone think they know what it means? Ethics or morality? No? It's conversations about what's right and what's wrong. Right? So if I say, is it right for me to go kill someone? What do you say? No. <laughs> Hopefully, right? Well, then I say, why not? What are you going to tell me? Because, because what? Because it's illegal. It's illegal? Oh, you're a legalist. I should only not do it because I'm going to be punished by the law. <laughs> Is that the only reason that I shouldn't kill someone? Because it's illegal? Why else shouldn't I kill someone? Uh, human right. Maybe the per I'm violating someone's human rights. They have a right to life. Right? Yeah. Good. Very good. Any other ideas? Does it affect me at all? Yeah, no. maybe. No? I mean, I'll be fine. The, the, <laughs> the, the people that kill, but not affect the, the other people, like friends. Yeah, so you're obviously affecting the person you kill, but they're friends, they're family, right? You're not thinking about them. But what about me, the killer? Does maybe, it affect me? What's the reason? Yeah. Maybe someday they are from where kill them. <laughs> well, maybe someone's going to try and seek revenge on me. But do you think that makes me a good person? No. Why not? You didn't get anything. Huh? You, you won't get anything by killing someone. What if I like it? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay, that's it then. Alright. <laughs> Is that okay? Mm. If I want to do it? It's up to No. <laughs> Why do we stop ourselves from doing things we want when we think they're wrong? Right? Like if you see money on the table, like I could take it. I would really enjoy that. But why shouldn't I do it? Because of legalism. How you yes. How you say that? Legalism. Legalism. Mm -hmm. So just because I might get caught, yeah. that's it. Not because I'll be a thief. What do we think about thieves and killers? Are they good people? Well, maybe. Maybe? Maybe. 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 maybe if they're doing it for a good reason. Yeah. Right? What are my reasons? Do you have any idea what my reasons are? Like in some movies, the killer is working for uh, work, uh, to kill someone for their family. Good, so maybe I need to protect someone I love? Yeah, maybe. Okay. So maybe I'm stealing to feed my children, right? Actually, that's not right. That's still not right. Because <laughs> the law, right? Yeah. yeah. So Confucius Kongzo was not so much concerned with the law. He was more concerned with what kind of person you were. And he wanted you to be what he calls a virtuous person. So on the inside, right, and this could be, if you think we have a soul, it could be your soul. If you think it's just our brains, it could be in your brain. What makes you a good person or a bad person? He was more concerned with that. Not so much the laws or the consequences of my actions. It doesn't really matter if someone's going to punish me later or if someone's going to try and seek revenge on me. He's more concerned with what kind of person you are. Right? Good people don't kill. <coughs> Good people don't steal. <coughs> For some other reason. So he wants to teach us how to focus on ourselves that way. Right? Become better people. And so his students often asked him about this. And what's really interesting is he gives different answers to different students. <laughs> what do we do with that? <laughs> we like one answer, right? Make it easy. No, this is not an easy conversation. So a lot of philosophers question this, right? Is he really being truthful if he's giving one answer to one student and a different answer to someone else? Well, they say it's like this. Virtue is not the same for everyone, right? The kinds of decisions you make in your life are going to be very different from the kinds of decisions you make in your life, right? You're different people. You have different family, different friends, different paths to go down. So, as a good teacher, right, when you ask me what the right thing to do is, I'm going to 
to take everything I know about you into consideration before I tell you. And then I'm going to tweak my answer so that it works for you. Right? And then with you, I'm going to take everything I know about you into consideration, and then I'm going to make my answer perfect for you. Right? So that's what they say. He's not wishy-washy or <laughs> saying different things or contradicting himself. He's just making sure that the lesson fits the student. So they say it like this. Truth is like a square. Right? You might come to me already having these pieces, so I'm going to give you this one. Right? But you might come to me with only these two corners, so I'm going to give you this one over here. And you might come to me with all of them, or you might come to me with none of them. Right? So truth is going to look different depending on who we're talking to. So giving different corners of the square to different people. Okay, so let's talk about human nature really quick. Well, he thought our human nature was good. But since society is so bad, especially during the Warring States period, it's very easy to turn good people into bad people. And I'm going to tell you a really quick story about something called Ox Mountain. So imagine there's a mountain. Your goodness is like little plants, like little seeds that have sprouted. Right? So under the surface in you, there's little sprouts. We call them moral sprouts. Right? We all have them. But, depending on what kind of family situation you have, whether or not you're in a stable financial situation, right, you might treat, this mountain might get treated differently, depending on your experience. So in the story, imagine a bunch of ox, right? You guys know what ox are? Big cows. Right? So they come along, and they start nibbling on your moral sprouts, right? That's what society does. Society tempts us to not be good people. Society nibbles on our sprouts. And so eventually, the ox or society have eaten our sprouts for so long that they're all gone. Right? So now we're gonna have people who are not very good. Aren't there a lot of people who are not very good in the world? Yeah, but it's not because they were born that way, right? The sprouts were there, but society kind of stomped on them, right? We have to take care of our moral sprouts so that they grow really big, right? So you have a very good nature, but we have to take care of it, right? So it doesn't get eaten by ox. <laughs> All right, I don't want to take up too much of the time. How am I doing on Good. good like done, or good like keep going? Keep going? Um, yeah, no, you can keep going. Okay, great. So, let's talk about how we don't eat the moral sprouts. <laughs> um, forgive me, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. So in order to become a really good person, a gentleman, a gentlewoman, we have to follow a couple rules, right? Not legalist rules, but rules of what an ideal virtuous person would be. And the first one is called Li, or ritual propriety, right? We have to respect the rituals. These are required to help us practice good behavior. So, have you ever found comfort in doing something over and over and over again, something repetitive? Some people sew, or uh, what else is repetitive? Coloring, yeah, those adult coloring books, right? You guys do anything like that, where it's the same motion over and over and over again? It's kind of relaxing. Some people garden. Anything like that? Playing games. Playing video games, so some, some sort of repetitive motion with your hands. It's very relaxing. Right? 
or do any of you play with like pens or you play with things while you're yeah, yeah right it feels it's nice right yeah you're all doing that <laughs> okay this is how rituals act when you do them over and over and over again not only does it make society operate better because everyone's behaving themselves it actually brings inner peace as well right? it's very comforting to engage in the rituals and more importantly, you become the kind of person who does the right things for the right reasons. Right? Don't just follow the rules because your parents tell you or because you're going to get punished if you don't. Follow the rules because you want to. Because you realize that the rules make life better. And hopefully, over time, it won't seem like a chore to do the rituals. Actually, you will take joy in them. So how do we figure out what the right rules are to follow? Because sometimes people give you bad advice, right? So in Confucianism, he talks about five important relationships. And the person on the right side always looks to the person on the left side for the rules. Okay. So the first relationship is between ruler and subject. Right? So we look to our rulers for the rules, for them to tell us what to do. Who's the ruler in the United States? Yeah, who's that? Obama, right? So we look to Obama and we say, not the laws that he put into place, but we look at his life and we say, what kind of person are you? Right? And that's how we should get an idea of how to behave. But also, our family is very important. So the rest of these relationships really have to do with closer bonds we have. The first one is between father and son. So sons, look to your father for an example. The second one is between husband and wife. Wives, look to your husbands for an example. Many people have challenged this. And you'll notice that that's the only woman in the bunch, is the wife. The next relationship is between the elder brother and the younger brother. So the younger brother needs to look to the older brother. And then finally, between friends, the younger friend should look to the older friend. So this assumes not just that people who are older than you, but also who are in positions of power, are wise. Right? They must be there because they know something. So we can learn from them. But that's not the only direction the relationship goes in. Because everybody on the left has so much power, they have a responsibility to take care of the person on the right. The ruler has a responsibility to the subject to do what they can to help them. The father has a responsibility to the son. The husband has a responsibility to the wife. So. So, do you think that will help you be a good person? Just look to these people in your lives, and they'll tell you what to do? Not only this mm, yeah. And Kongsa knew that that might be a problem, right? Because <laughs> we're talking about the Warring States period. Things are kind of crazy. So, he has a rule. If you're on the right side, and you disagree with someone on the left, you get one chance to change their mind. <coughs> One chance. This is called remonstrating. Okay. So if you say, hey, mom or dad, I really want to go out on Friday, and they say, no, you need to do your homework, you have one chance to argue with them, <laughs> but you should be respectful. And you try to persuade them to change their mind. And the idea is, if what you're trying to persuade them of is really the right thing to do, you should be able to convince them. If you can't convince them to change their mind, 
That means that what you were trying to do, you probably should have been trying to do. <laughs> so if you can't persuade your parents to let you go to the whatever the movies on Friday, that's probably not what you should be doing. <laughs> but if it is what you should be doing, then you will have reason on your side, right? If it's what you should be doing, you'll have that mo that those tools to convince them. So if you can't convince them, Kongza says it's your fault. <laughs> And this is part of the fact that our individual needs do not come first. Even if the people on the left are wrong, it's more important to him that we maintain social harmony. That comes first. And we can't have social harmony if families are fighting. And families won't fight as long as we abide by these rules. Does that sound good to everybody? Yes? Where are your daughters up here? I just, this time, as a daughter, don't have rights. Mm -hmm. uh, like, women don't have, uh, you know, they don't have rights to uh, argue with uh, men. That's right. And so this has something to do with the way Confucian societies are set up. They view women's place as where? Out in public? Is that where women belong? At work? <coughs> they belong at home, according to Kongza. And, I don't know if any of you know this, but Chinese homes are actually divided into two parts. They're squares, ah, uh, squares, right? <laughs> and the internal square is where the women live. And the outside square is where the men live. So not only are they not leaving their house, they're not even going to the part of their house that gets close to the outside. So their job is to make sure that the family runs well, because then, their children will grow up and go out into the world and make the world better. But it starts with them. So women have a role, but it's not for themselves. It's for society. So be a dutiful wife and mother, not for you, but for your family, and for your family will help society. And then, of course, if society is running smoothly, the idea is that individual people will live better lives. Okay, so it's kind of like a circle. Circle of life. <laughs> circle of duty. <laughs> okay. So when someone follows these rituals, they're going to become a good person. Right? The rituals are happening on the outside. They become a good person, and then they develop something on the inside, which he calls righteousness. And righteousness is a lot of different things. It shows itself through what he calls the master virtue, the most important virtue you could cultivate, which is called goodness or Ren. Okay. Ren has two meanings, one in Mandarin and one in Cantonese. And this is, in, this is from classical Chinese. In Mandarin, Ren means humane love. So extending goodness to common people and caring about others the way you care about yourself. In Cantonese, it means being a civilized person. So this is more about the rituals. Choosing to follow the rituals of your own free will. But these two things go together. By following the rituals, you will learn to care about everyone. Hold on, didn't I just tell you to care about your family first? Huh? No, I didn't. <clears throat> I should have. 
So this is you in your house. <laughs> right? Who teaches you how to be a good person first? Our mother. Okay. mother. Your parents. Her brother. Right? Your brothers, your sisters, anyone else who lives with you, right? Who grew up with older you? Older than you. Older than you. Older than you, exactly. So that's who you should care about first. Your family. And Kungzi even talks about a son who helps his father escape after his father murdered someone. So he knows his dad did this really terrible thing, but his family comes first. He's going to break the law to help his dad. Right? Okay. So we have our immediate family. Okay. And then what's the next part of your life? After your family, who, who do you Friend. learn? Your friends, exactly, right? So in the neighborhood around you with the other houses. Right? Or at school. But would you know how to be friends with someone if your family never taught you anything about being nice? No. So again, your family has to come first because they will teach you how to be nice to others. And then as you get older, you're going to get a job. You're going to travel. The only way you can ever care about someone in another part of the world is if you learn how to care about your family first. <clears throat> so it's very important, but it serves a purpose. Right? Family comes first because that teaches us how to care about anybody else, even if they're a stranger. And this dedication to family, um, I think it's somewhere on this thing, is called filial piety. Putting your family first. Yeah. This is belong to yeah, this room. I'm sorry? I think you are just talking about this belong to room. Right, that's part of it. This is part of becoming a good person, right? So you aren't going to know how to learn to be good from your family or learn how to extend that to your friends if you don't think about that, right? So it's not enough to just go out into the world and then just act without thinking, right? To be good involves careful consideration of the kinds of situations you find yourself in. Right? What if a friend asks you to lie for them? You really have to think about the situation. Right? What does it mean to be a good friend to them? I also want to be honest. Right? Is their lie hurting somebody else? Right? You have to think about all of those things. But in order to think about that, you have to want to be a good person. right? If you didn't care about being good, you wouldn't give it a second thought. You just do whatever you want. First, first thought. Done. You should also practice sympathetic understanding, or shoot. And this is that caring about others the way you care about yourself. But you're not just giving them some sort of consideration. You're literally treating them as if however you would treat yourself. And so this comes to a very specific rule, which is very popular because in Christianity, they talk about the golden rule. Have you ever heard of the golden rule? No? It says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Kongza came up with that first. <laughs> But he flipped it around. He said, do not do unto others as you would not have them do unto you. And philosophers think that this one is actually really much better than the other. And it's because of a funny problem called the sadomasochist problem. Do you know what a sadomasochist is? 
Someone who enjoys pain? <laughs> yeah. So let's say I'm a sadomasochist, and I'm following the golden rule. I should do unto you what I would want you to do to me. What if I want you to poke me with something sharp in the arm for five hours? Should I do that to you? But the golden rule told me. <laughs> no, so the negative golden rule is supposed to be better. Because when it comes to what we like, we actually don't have a lot in common. Right? We all like different things. But when it comes to what we don't like, we don't like suffering, we don't like starving, we don't like having our feelings hurt, we don't like dying. Right? We actually have a lot more of that in common. So this is a better rule to decide what you would not want done unto you. Because well, I don't know what you like, right? Do you know what I like? No. So how can you? You can't know what to do to me. But I'm sure you can guess what I don't like. <laughs> In the ways that count, not like I don't like Brussels sprouts, right? <laughs> In the ways that matter. And the final one, the one that we started talking about with filial piety, is called partial care, right? You should care more about people who are close to you, because that will teach you how to care for people who are further away. Right? And that leads to filial piety. So it's not just prop not just acceptable, but proper to care more about family and close friends than others and to give them special treatment. And he also thought that this was realistic. Do you remember back at the beginning I talked about Moism and we should just care about everyone equally? Do you think you could care about a stranger the same way you care about a member of your own family? No, no. Kongza didn't think so either. He says that's not realistic. This is natural for you, right? So let's learn how to do this in a way that makes us better people. Thank you so much for having me today. Hopefully I'll see you in the future.